I'm here in Arizona and I'm driving down Highway 10 to Tempe to visit Grant Petta, an artist, a curator and a writer who is based at the 100 Gallery at Arizona State University. Tell me what sort of career trajectory took you from practice to what you're doing now? Uh, well, I started out getting a regular um, BFA and MFA, like the the course that most art, art students take. Um, I did that at Art Center College of Design and then my master's at University of Irvine. Mm. Um, but University of Irvine was kind of a theory heavy school. Um, and I combined that with traveling back and forth to European graduate school, uh, where I studied with different critics and philosophers and artists too. Um, really broad staff. Um, but that was the start of the kind of transition in a way from uh, painting into theory and that I had to obviously write a dissertation and this kind of thing. Um, and just more curating as a regular practice. Mm. Um, and I did that for a number of years and, and showed widely um, within some great shows that I, that I still love. But the spectrum of creativity for me shifted towards curating full time, um, which is what I do here at Arizona State. Uh, we have, uh, we're the largest university in the U.S. with the largest curatorial program in the U.S. Um, in terms of how many shows we do a year, how broad our curatorial initiatives are. Mm. Um, we have 26 currently um, that are ongoing and then all the regular BFA, MFA, club, teacher, student shows mixed in with the curatorial initiatives. Wow. So that's, that's kind of, <clears throat> that's been about, I guess, 15 or 20-ish years now. Because yeah. I left to do my undergrad in California about 97, 98, and we're looking at 2018, so it's the tw 20th year. Mm. Yeah. And how long were you, um, how long were you sort of focusing on your practice before you made that move across? About a decade. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, a strong decade of painting. Um, started out as a figurative painter. Yeah. Um, didn't particularly get a lot of traction with that. Um, I don't think I was bad at it, but I didn't, I just didn't have that much to say um, at the, at, when I first started out. And then as an abstract painter, um, I think the transition was easier from working representationally and abstraction. Mm. Um, you just had more in your in your toolkit to work with, really, um, and that that went much better for me. Um, that I think was a, a fairly successful run. Um, so I got a number of awards and and I got to be in shows with curators like Lucy Lepard and Edward Lucy Smith mm. and um, so just some just some great experiences, you know. Yeah, it it's funny I think about uh, what you just said then about not having. Not having anything to say. No, not when you first start out. No, I, I absolutely agree because, in a way, that's why I abandoned my, you know, practice at the time. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've, I, do you do you find that um, uh, writing uh, gives you something different in that regard? I, I think of them as the same. Yeah. Um, I almost think of writing as painting pictures. Yeah. Um, I was I was writing three um, press releases this last week, and they, I write long, academic style press releases, which are not particularly popular because people <laughs> don't like to read that much. Um, but a lot of them get um, end up in other uh, being migrated to other sources. So sometimes they'll end up being expanded into criticism or expanded into catalog essay. Um, and I'm a big fan of of doing that, of having one thing that you can um, just kind of grow a little bit into the next um, either promotional item or criticism or catalog essay or whatever. Um, but no, I think of it as painting a picture. Uh, and I think that's because I painted for so long. Mm. Um, as where I know a lot of my writer friends who are just writers think about language in a very different way than I do. Yeah. How do you think you think about it? That is um, different. I, I would say impressionistically. Yeah. Um, and not, I'm not so concerned with syntax as a kind of um, image production in the mind, almost like uh, writing as a kind of gestalt um, practice. So it's a little, you know, mm. writers are always, will really fetishize the words and really, you know, and I, I like a good turn of phrase, but I'm looking to give an overall impression at the end of the day, almost as if you stood back from the piece, you'd be seeing that whole exhibition or you'd be seeing that whole artist au revoir or um, whatever, but you'd get the larger picture from the text rather than some of the minutiae that sometimes happens in highly academic writing.
Mm, mm. Yeah. Do you find because you uh, you obviously uh, do things like catalog essays and that kind of thing? Um, do you find that uh, there is a uh, a different style of writing that comes with something like a catalog essay uh, than, than a more academic kind of writing? Well, yeah, if you do straight academic writing, you have to um, be a bit more particular about your footnotes and your style and uh, yeah. and where it's ending up, ultimately. Um, but I think there's such a diversity of writing in the arts right now, and I think curatorial practice is exploding with all of these different um, methods. And some people come at, at curatorial practice from a very academic place, um, some from practice, some from political engagement, some from being non-profit organizers, some from... Um, like community engagement um, and they're all really valuable um, but I think each person's voice ends up being the outcome of the history of their life and what what they've been engaged with mm -hmm. um, I mean being here obviously I've been engaged with a lot a lot of texts and a lot of reading and, and so um, there is always an academic uh, edge to what I'm writing um, it's a little bit more highbrow but I still really try to package it um, that anyone can enjoy it Mm. Um, so I try to I try to reach the broadest audience I can with how I write, and I think that's part of the responsibility of being a, a curator. Mm. Um, you know, you definitely don't want to have people read it and immediately be turned off by the jargon in it, right? Like they just they just don't know what that is, so they stop reading. Yeah. Um, so finding a balance there is a little bit tricky, um, but I've been doing it long enough. I, I feel pretty comfortable with it. Yeah, that for me as well. When I write, that's that's my approach. I always think, okay, my job here is first and foremost to communicate and interpret and explain to some extent right right yeah. and you know that uh, that means that I tend to uh, I tend to write you know kind of shorter sentences right. really direct you know much less the the convoluted you know yeah um, e even when I'm writing sort of theory stuff oh yeah 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 yeah. That's well, and I think I think things are changing that way. I mean, I think the era of high theory was really the '80s and '90s. Yeah. Um, '70s was, '60s were great too, but it's with everything shifting towards even the format that we're speaking in today. Yeah. Um, uh, and in image culture, you have to be more effective with less all the time. Yeah. Um, at least in terms of of writing, um, and it does it does change your style a little bit. I think so. Yeah, there, there was a there was a period of time there I think as well following the eighties because I was in I was doing my PhD during the nineties and I yeah. felt this kind of um, impulse myself to kind of make it as uh, elaborate, mm -hmm. make the language as elaborate as possible. And I think that a lot of that comes from um, you know translations of French theory that were happening. Right, right. Well, in that period was the period of heavy like semiotex production yeah. and. And you know, now we're in the age where, like, um, the publisher of Sibio Texas, like, uh, I think a, they made an Amazon show on Chris Kraus and her, her husband, yeah. um, who, who did that. And so it, it, it's weird to see it as mass entertainment, um, like, 20 years later. Because yeah. if you told me, like, that th their lives would become, like, a, a television show, I would tell you you were crazy in the 80s. Like, that was, the, like, the heart of critical art production. And now it's kind of like a soap opera mm. for this generation. Because my, my kids here watch that. And that's what they think of as theory. Yeah. And it's like, no, we were all reading it. Like, yeah. it wasn't a TV show. <laughs> um, so it, you, it, you just think of how much times have changed, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, I was going to say something about the... Uh, social media, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, do you find that you use social media in terms of your own writing to some extent? I don't mean, like so much as a source material but as a way of uh, disseminating that to, a, to an audience? Not yet. Um, I can see a future point where that's going to become essential. Mm. Um, I think I think for everyone. I kind of remember when I was marketing my first book and publishing has changed so much that there's a lot more go between um, between the writer and how, how the text gets out there. Mm. Um, and being responsible for your side of the promotions or your side of the production and where the book should ultimately end up in whose hands. Um, now it seems like you absolutely have to do some some social media um, promotion. But that was kind of like the first round when I really learned about that kind of promotion in terms of writing. Um, but we're producing a series of stuff here uh, at Arizona State that includes text and image um, with every show we do. Mm. Um, whether it's just quotes, um, whether it's some background information. So 
yeah, we're like kind of already there in a way. Uh, my personal practice outside of here hasn't quite taken up that, but we do produce it here all the time. Mm. Yeah. When did you uh, When did you move to uh, Phoenix? I came back. It's been uh, about three and a half years now. Yeah. 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 Was so. oh, so you originally from? Uh, no, I grew up in California. Yeah. Um, until I was a teenager, and then I moved out here for high school. Yeah. Um, moved back to California for uh, college. And then stayed there um, for about 15 years and then just came back. Mm. So I was just bouncing back and forth between the two states. Mm. And how do you find the difference between, you know, the, the scene here and uh, to, to L.A.? It, there's things that are the same and then there's things that are, are radically different. Yeah. I mean, I think around the world when you find artists, you find an incredibly committed people, right? Mm. They're just, art is one of the most hardcore things you can kind of do with your life and existence. Um, it's an uphill battle lot of days mm -hmm. um, and when I came to Phoenix and found the producers here I, I was met with even a greater level of sort of awe and amazement because here is really hot and the studios are not necessarily air-conditioned so when you meet producers that have dedicated their life to making art and they're in like a hundred hundred ten degree heat and they're still doing it yeah um, that's sort of amazing in its own right um, but one of the other conditions I mean Arizona has this whole series of conditions that is different than a major cosmopolitan area. Yeah. Although we are the fifth largest city in the nation. Mm. Um, so we are, I mean, we are a big city. Um, but obviously Arizona is a conservative state. Mm. Um, so things you do here can end up having a huge impact. Mm. Um, you know, it's like when you're in a big city, you always want traction. Everyone wants to do a thing and feel the impact and get the immediate response. and. At, like have a little bit of that feeling of the of, of the avant-garde in a way that you're yeah. sort of pushing boundaries and and all that kind of thing it's very hard to do um, in a town that has a ton of MFAs a ton of working artists um, all trying to get traction right yeah. and and the town itself may be fairly liberal so nothing may be that shocking yeah um, and we did a series of shows here last year that were out of sight in terms of shocking that probably I don't know if they would have been as shocking in LA. I, d I doubt it. Yeah. Um, but we had the the curators from the Mexicali Biennial come and do a show during the election period, um, and they invited a bunch of artists um, from Guatemala and Tijuana and, and Arizona, and California, just all around, um, to kind of bring in voices that maybe weren't heard during the election cycle. And we did do it on the election period we opened the show before the results came in oh, right yeah and there's no problems yeah and then the results came in and the next day was the first day that i got death threats all day oh my god um and it continued for the full month because the show Whoa. was the show was kind of like radically misinterpreted yeah um and it ended up on all four major news stations it ended up on abc nbc fox yeah. and telemundo um, and we had to really work with the community um, to get people in and understanding yeah. um, what was kind of going on. Mm. Um, but there was a lot of misreadings of that work. Um, but it was it was sort of one of those moments um, where you can have a state talking about what you're doing. Mm. Uh, you know, and in California, you're lucky if you get like the the city to notice, much less the whole you know state. Yeah. Um, and so that was really great. Um, yeah. And we were able to keep the show up the whole time. It didn't come down. We made our run. Yeah. Um, and after that, we did a show of 40-plus uh, women artists that had all had their work censored in Arizona. Yeah. Um, and that was combined with a lineup of um, all women working in noise art. Mm. Um, for that night and that was the, that kind of shook the building and sort of um, it was a very challenging evening I was going to say because uh, you know some of the noise art stuff is kind of right it's you know, yeah, it, really it's kind of it's super nice loud stuff, yeah. Um, yeah. and to have that much work that was regularly um, you know censored for one reason or another in a in a single venue mm. um, is again a lot in a conservative state in a, in a, mm. in a sort of more liberal state they, Maybe maybe nothing, you know, mm. maybe just like, oh, yeah, I get it. You know, I see what they're pointing out with that. Um, but I think that's part of the fun of Arizona is you can do stuff um, and you do get a, a, a conversation going that involves the whole community every time. Mm. Um, as we're anywhere else, there may be all these sub-communities. Um, this group doing that, this group doing that, and they may they may never cross paths. Mm. Um, in, a, in a smaller art scene, you, you're just running all over each other. 
Um, so even more conservative shows um, that I did last year. I did one at Bentley Gallery here in town that was um, an abstract show, which I don't I don't consider abstraction at all inherently conservative, but many people do. Mm. Um, but that got seven reviews and one national review, you know, mm. and it was like, so you can do these things that, ha you know, you get a lot of feedback on what you're doing. Um, and it's, it's a different kind of intensity, you know. It, it's smaller, but what happens is more um, impactful in, in the immediate. Uh, so mm. that's, I know the whole time I was in California that that's kind of what, in a way you're hoping will happen all yeah. the time and it does happen here and there you yeah. know but um but it's much more anything goes there really isn't it you know? it, it is it's it's uh, when something really great happens i think in california um people just really appreciate it yeah um but here people really react to it uh, mm. and that's a that's a sort of like different thing you know mm. um I, I think that's probably one of the, one of the biggest differences. Yeah, you're mm. working in a smaller fishbowl with larger ideas, so it's gonna, you know, it's gonna push people around in that situation. Mm. When I've been talking to people on this last trip, because this is the this is the first trip actually that I've done talking to artists in America mm -hmm. since the election as well, and it's it's interesting how uh, it seems to have because I think you know obviously. Nobody was expecting Trump to win. Right. Um, and the the plus side to that is that, to me, it seems like there's been a real kind of, um, a real revival, not revival, but a, a vital, a revitalization of people's kind of um, political engagement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, I think it brings uh, the left together a little bit more, obviously, because it's going it's going to energize um, mm. them. Because even the even the minor differences that the left experiences within itself um, immediately become null and void when they have to go protest, when they have to go organize. So, I mean, that's how it is here. The left is far smaller here, um, and people do start making more interesting work. Mm. Um, you know, it was a bit like the cycle in California, which wasn't necessarily political, but when the when the banks um, sort of failed and the economy took a tumble, yeah. you saw a lot of work that was sort of um, lightweight vanish in the years that followed, and you saw a lot more political work emerge that was strong, and I think in general you saw much stronger artists emerge from that period. Mm. Um, it acted as kind of a, like a clearinghouse, uh, like just like <laughs> what didn't really need to stay sort of vanished. Um, so I think all these crises in, induce something for the art community, whether they're an economic crisis or a political change, or um, you see the tenor of, of cultural discourse shift. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, I, I think the hard part is people don't even know where to begin with Trump. You know, it's like people yeah. people want to shifting sands, isn't it? Yeah, it's time. it's yeah, it's a really it's a really I think a tough period because I can remember you know Occupy when everyone had at least. Um, an idea of how they were going to deal with the situation, mm. an idea of how they were going to organize. Um, and here it's just kind of like someone who's sort of a daily affront to like your, your sensibilities. So it's, <laughs> it's very hard to locate like how to even um, uh, organize well against that, that sort of situation. You know, I, I think what happened was a real political anomaly. Uh, but finding the finding the proper reaction to it, um, which could take any form, um, but finding the unifying one that's as strong as Occupy or previous counterculture um, sort of movements that happen in the art, I, I think is a tough one for this generation. They're looking they're looking at climate change on one hand and being like, there's stuff we've got to change on Earth, and then you know, I mean, Trump's policies there are horrible. That would be a place to begin, but just all yeah. of his policies in mass. So they. They're kind of looking at two things at, at, at the same time, a change of life and civilization and values, um, maybe even in total, like maybe even the current form of capitalism doesn't really serve them. Um, and like how to be politically engaged in, in the system that we currently inhabit. Um, and that, I just think that's really different, different scenario.